This town is your town. This town is our town. This town was made for you and me. Hello, everybody. This is Brian O'Haran with episode 12 of Spreading the Word, a program dedicated to informing as much as possible the citizens of the town of Winchester, the city of Winstead, and its two lakes about the total rewrite, the planning and zoning regulations taking place now in our town, city, and lakes. As I mentioned last week, there are two more public hearings scheduled on these new regulations. The next one is on October 11th at 7 p.m. in the town hall because less people are expected to attend, which I think is a mistake by the residents of the town, but that's the way things go when you're dealing with government. The other one is in regard to the application that was submitted by Mickey Ham, a former 14-year member of the Planning and Zoning Commission in the good old days and six years as Vice Chairman of the Planning and Zoning Commission, Mickey Ham was representing about maybe 200 to 220 signatures from people mostly around the lake that are concerned about the elimination of Section 10.6 last July 22nd from the Planning and Zoning Regulations. So there'll be a public hearing on that, and that'll be on the 24th of October. So if a decision is made without changing and including the words that we need in there, to return Section 10.6 at the October 11th meeting, public hearing, then we will still have one more chance to get the attention of planning and zoning at least one more time. And people can attend for that if they're interested, especially people around the lake or town that have non-conforming properties This whole thing, as we can see, is headed towards making this a bedroom community town like Litchfield, Goshen, Harwinton, and really increasing any of the environmental rules and restrictions to make it more difficult for people to do things unless they follow all these environmental rules and restrictions. So, it is tough. My own feeling is that planning and zoning will get most of what they want, but they are being affected a little bit by the feedback they're getting from the public that we've been pushing for for the last few months. Now, I want to point out to you that the longer the time is before they get approval for these planning and zoning regulations, the better it is for all residents, taxpayers in the town, their friends, neighbors, relatives, future generations, because it gives people more time to read and understand the regulations with the help of 
a land use engineer, and perhaps a land use attorney, if possible, and if they can afford it. A lot of people just say, hey, we can't afford that, so we're not going to get involved. We're not going to ask for any changes on our property, etc., etc., because in order to spend a dollar, nowadays, you have to earn two dollars. So many people just back off of asking for changes to their property, unless they can't afford it, of course, because they don't want to pay for a land use attorney and a land use engineer. That's how it goes nowadays. If you do have a need, you might want to put in an application now under the current regulations because it may be changed in the new regulations. People are strapped. The town people, especially at the lake, are gentrifying. More and more people are leaving for the winter months. Many people are leaving permanently for the south where the taxes are less, especially if they don't need employment because they're retired. They head out. And they put their properties up for sale. You can see that all over the place, especially on the lake. And with this poor economy at the state and federal level, tending towards worse, it's tough for them to even sell their houses or properties for the kind of money they thought they would be getting. Many people have told me, Brian, we were relying on a, the sale of our houses, which most people tell you not to do, but they did, for our retirement years to help us with our retirement and our grandchildren's education and our children's retirement or whatever. And they're finding out now that they're trapped. They can't get out. So it's good that these hearings are happening, and the more hearings we have, public hearings, before they accept these regulations, the better off we'll be. Because that gives everybody a chance to understand them if they can, and they're not easy to understand. They're very complex. There's a lot of if, if ands, and buts. And if you go down and talk to the land use director and the building inspector, they'll try to be as helpful to you as they can, and the town manager too. They'll try to be as helpful as they can. But in the end, the decision is with the commission itself and the ZBA. And that's where all the ifs, ands, and buts come up. Well, if this, if that, you can have this, if this, if that. And the feedback I'm getting around the lake in town is people don't understand those ifs and ands and buts. They think they can go 20 feet when in certain, in most cases, they can't because they're already in the setbacks or too close to water. And if they apply, they may get it and they may not. That's where all the ifs, ands, and buts come in and that's where you need the attorney and that's where you need the, the uh, land use engineer to help you get through all this stuff, to help you get what you need. Now, if we have real extreme environmental conditions, which we're tending towards, then people won't want to move here. Why would they want to come here? They'll go elsewhere. And that'll force the property values down. And as you know, when the property values go down, it may be a little easier to sell your house at a loss or at a uh, lesser value. But the mill rate still goes up, and you still have to pay for the 80 miles of roads that were built many, 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 many years ago for walking traffic, for horses, for carriages, and things like that. They're very expensive to fix now because usually you have to go for grants from the state, even if you are going to have a bond issue, which will raise your taxes, of course, because you'll have to pay for that interest 
in principle on the bond issue for many, many years. And some people say, yeah, but, you know, some bond issues have already expired. And I said on previous programs, when bond issues expire, people say, oh, we've got more money available to spend. I've heard one mayor say that. Matter of fact, I've heard the existing mayor say that before when she wasn't a mayor at one time. So they think that's found money. So anyway, it's complex. And people will say, well, let's go somewhere where we don't have to pay for all that environmental cleanup and all those environmental rules that they're going to put in the new planning and zoning regulations. And they just won't do it. They'll go elsewhere. They may even go south. They might follow General Electric. They might follow Pratt & Whitney. They might follow some of the other companies in our area that are moving out. Matter of fact, there's no might about it. They most likely will. So we'll become the bedroom community as we are tending towards now. If you go down to Torrington and go up East Main Street and go into any of those stores, all you'll see, in addition to the Torrington people themselves, are people from Winston. A lot of them from the lake. If you stand on the corner of Route 8 and the Highland Lake Road on a Saturday morning and maybe even a Sunday morning, you'll see cars streaming down from the lake to go shopping in Torrington. They can get all their needs taken care of down there. They can buy anything they want. They have all the stores. And that's kind of what these people want you to do. That's what they want you to do. So the way they're going, that's going to happen. So all you can do now is just try to understand what kind of a pickle you will be in with these new regulations. Will they help you? They might. Will they hurt you? They might. But it's best to find out now before these regulations become law. Because once they become law, you won't have any choice anymore. You'll have to hire the lawyer. You'll have to hire the engineer. You'll have to spend a lot of money fighting for your rights. You might have to go to ZBA. And many people go to ZBA like 636 did. They go to, they went to P&Z, then they went to ZBA, then they went back to P&Z again. It all costs money. It all costs money. And if you have to spend ten to 20000 for that kind of a, an effort, these people aren't cheap. They get hundreds of, hundred, hundreds of dollars an hour. And when they have to attend meetings and sit around for two or three hours, they will charge you. And if they go to the meeting and somebody says, hey, you don't have all the proper information you're supposed to have when you come here, they'll have to come back again. And that will cost you because they'll have to sit around for a few hours again, wait their turn, and then get their say. And they may have to do this over and over until you finally get your permits. And that may take a year or two. I think it took 636, even with Section 10.6, about a year, a year and a half, and cost them quite a bit of money to get their approvals. But they got them because they hired a good land use engineer and a very good land use attorney. And they proved to the town planning and zoning commission and the town attorney, there is a letter from the attorney stating the facts, that they should have had what they were asking for all along. Now they might have had to change it a little bit, but they got their permission. That in turn and riled the Planning and Zoning Commission. You can hear that if you listen to the meeting I put up on YouTube where they were saying blasphemous things about Section 10.6, especially the chairman of the commission. And one of the reasons why they wanted to remove it without any written direction or written opinion 
on paper, in the public domain, from the town attorney. They did it on their own. They acted irresponsibly, in my opinion, irrationally, in my opinion, recklessly, in my opinion, to remove Section 10.6 that was in for 22 years to balance the planning regulations, planning and zoning regulations, as much as they could when they increased the side yard setbacks many years ago to deter condos from being built on Highland Lake and other such places. Now, the condo people on Highland Lake that do have them, they're happy with them. They like them. They're able to enjoy the lake. It isn't at a great cost to them. They're right near the beach. Their children can go swimming in the beach across the street, in the water near the beach across the street. And they aren't hurting anybody. I don't know anybody that doesn't want those condos there. I did get one person tell me one time, well, maybe we should buy that building that's for sale, that condo that's for sale, tear it down and make it into open space. And that's the kind of extreme I don't like. Because when I grew up as a factory kid in Torrington, Connecticut, many years ago, my mom would have given a lot for the worst piece of property and the smallest condo and be very pleased. We would go out for one or two days a summer to the various lakes in the area, get up early in the morning at 4 a.m. so we could get a table and perhaps a cooking uh, unit. Sometimes we came to Highland Lake for that. That park is gone now, not there anymore. The beach related to it, not there now. Gone. When they raised the water four feet, most of the beaches got half wiped out in the summertime so less people from the town can go on them and enjoy them. And they were wiped out because the people on the lake wanted to have speedboats, which before that, there weren't that many of, for water skiing, dragging people on floats, and all that kind of thing. Well, that hurt the town a lot because the beaches are pretty much wiped out now. We can't even afford to have lifeguards up there too much anymore because the town is can't afford it. Paying 65% of their money to the schools, plenty of uh, spending in the schools that could be managed better, all kinds of things like that. So what you need to do, if you can, and I know you're all busy working and taking care of your grandkids and taking care of your children and all that kind of thing, you need to get down there to the town hall and ask Stephen Sedlowski, the land use director, make an appointment with him. He'll be responsive. He'll listen to you. may not always agree with you. Might, uh, might not always be able to give you the right advice, but at least he will try. And Mark Melancing, the building inspector, who gives out most of the permits, he'll tell you what's, what's needed. He tries to follow the law, and if he doesn't follow the law, then it can be appealed, and it can be appealed at the state level, if worse comes to worse. But he'll try to follow the law. He doesn't make the rules. Those rules will be made by the planning and zoning commission, and they have to follow certain state statutes. They can't just do anything they want. So there's always that question that's involved. Are they following the state statutes? So it gets very, very, very complex. And you can't afford it, uh, to have everybody understand it. Uh, that's why we have experts. I use the example of a doctor. Not everybody can perform an operation on a person. They have to be well-trained, hopefully well-experienced and qualified to do the particular operation that they're going to do. Now, if you can remember, way back in the old days, to get a tooth pulled, they would wrap the string around your tooth, 
tie one end to the door and slam the door to get your tooth out. And I'll bet that really hurt, although I never experienced it. But dealing with our land use boards and commissions it is very, very difficult and very painful. Just like having your tooth out in the old days when it hurt a lot to do so. Well, because it's so complex and these PNZ regulations and state statutes and all these things, they're all very, very, very complex. There's a lot of ifs, ands, and buts involved. Not everybody, including myself, can understand all this. That's why we have to hire experts, land use engineers, land use attorneys to get, help us get through this mess. Now, the town and state itself, they just throw everything back at you the applicant. You have to go and find out the facts. You have to dig through all the files in the town hall to find the information you need. You have to do this. You have to do that. We can't afford to do any of that. Now, when you go down to try to find all these records, that takes a certain amount of expertise, too. And it certainly takes a lot of time a lot of energy, and a lot of understanding, which most people don't have, and if they even if they do have, can't probably do. Hence the need for the engineer and the legal advice, which costs a lot of money. And remember, to spend a dollar, you got to earn two dollars in this day and age. So, once again, time is running out now. We only have a few more public hearings. And uh, about a month from now, uh, plus a day or two, maybe a day or two less, we don't have that opportunity anymore because PNZ is determined, determined to approve these regulations. They will have some changes in them. The people that have gone in now over the last month or two have convinced them that some changes probably should be made. Steve Sedlowski, the land use director, has about eight things on his plate, maybe a little more now, that he wants to bring up at the next meeting for consideration by the Planning and Zoning Commission. Now, Steve doesn't get a vote in any of this. He's just the intermediary. He's the project manager. He's the guy who pulls everything together and gets them the information. But he can't be part of the decision-making. If he can convince them, if he can encourage them, if he can suggest to them, that is very good. But he cannot demand anything. He can't demand anything from this commission. He has to plead. And sometimes he'll win. And sometimes he'll lose. And in the past, planning and zoning directors, land use directors, have given up. They tried for years to help get things through, and they failed. So they finally gave up, and they went elsewhere where it would be a little easier to work, and where perhaps the rewards would be better one way or the other, and certainly the satisfaction of doing their job in the proper manner would be appreciated. So anyway, we'll hear some more at the next public hearing, I don't exactly know everything, but they're going to, you know, they're concerned about sheds. They're concerned about things like that. So you'll find some more things being put on the table. They may or may not be able to agree to those during the next public hearing. You may have to extend it again. That'd be good for us because the longer the time takes, the more chance and opportunity you residents have to get in there and try to understand these regulations and to try to find out how they will affect you. Now, I talked to other people around the lake over the last few weeks, and they just misinterpret what was said at these meetings. They misinterpret what the planning and zoning land use director and the commissioners said 
when they responded to the audience at the planning and zoning public hearing that was held on October 11th. You can see for yourself what happened uh, at the meeting. You can pick up a copy of the voice recording from the town hall and the planning director's office, or you can go to Charter TV and ask them for a copy of the DVD that lasts two and a half hours, and you can take it home and watch it on your in your own home. It's a long time to sit through, but worthwhile. It's also being, being played on Charter, if you have Charter, Channel 190, 2 or 3 or 4, one of those channels. Being played on those channels, maybe even 191. You can call up down there. The number is 860-738-5090. And you can ask them when they're playing this 2 and 3 quarter hour program that will be on their website and that they will be playing on for the next, I don't know, few weeks or so, probably until the next public hearing. You can ask them when it's going to be on, and you can watch it. It's long, but it's worth watching. You'll get a good feeling. Some of the people that brought up issues will get probably some satisfaction. Others may not, but the important thing is for everybody to get a chance and an opportunity in our society to understand what's being done and when it's going to be done and how it's going to affect them as residents, property owners, people who rent apartments and houses. It affects everybody. When costs go up, an opportunity goes down, that affects everybody. You probably know I've been all over, around the Iron Curtain over the years, and since I was in my late 20s, and through all the socialistic countries, helping them introduce their giant computer systems into airlines and banks and companies and all that kind of thing. So I know a lot about socialism. <laughs> Lived in London for 15 years. All three children were born there. And we know a lot about it. We know what happens when people promise you things that are going to really raise the costs and they're really going to lower the values. And as you probably know, some of you older people, and in communism, which is the extreme that I don't think we'll ever get to, but you never know, you don't own anything. Everything's owned by the state. And in socialism, part of the problem is all the free stuff costs a lot of money. And the people who do work have to pay for all that. They have to pay for all that, so the taxes go up to 80% or 70% or 60%. And then people begin to leave the country when they, when they introduced the medical stuff in the socialistic countries, the doctors left the country. They came here, they went to Canada, they went to Australia, New Zealand. They got out. What you could get done was limited. If they put in a free education, then you had to take a test when you were 11 years old. And if you passed that test, you might get a free education. If you didn't, your grandmother and mother and father and relatives or whatever else would have to pay for it. And then they put in all the free medical. Everything was free. But the problem was that you couldn't get a lot of things anymore if you were a certain age. Couldn't get it. A lot of people did leave the country to get operations done. Had to pay for them themselves. Canada, a lot of Canadians came down here to uh, America to get their medical needs taken care of if they couldn't be covered under the social, more socialistic approach. And, of course, the same thing about people from all over the world. 
And because we are one of the best capitalistic systems in the world, people come from all over the world to start their businesses here. It's not a surprise that all these major computer companies started in America and continue to do so. Now, the investors in all these companies are from all over the world because they can't invest in their own area. It won't pay off. So they go outside. Now Americans are starting to go, like Apple, keep all their money outside of the country. You'll hear a lot about that in the recent presidential debates and arguments and discussions and propaganda, TV shows and news shows and all that. You'll hear a lot about that kind of stuff. So I have to say over and over and over and over and over again, if you do own property here, you should look at it with your family, see what you want to do with it over the next 10 years or maybe even 20 even if it's an evolutionary approach, a little here, a little there, a little more in a few more years, a little more a few more years after that, which is what most people do as they grow through life and earn more money and have more children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren or whatever and are retired and want to spend more time here. That's what most people do. You should understand all that and go down to the town hall and talk to the planning director, land use director, and the building inspector. He's a very busy guy. It's hard to get in there and see him. He's out all the time, you know, looking at things and checking on things and making sure everybody's following the rules and before he awards them their occupancy notice. So he's not always there. He runs around quite a bit, doing a lot of, a lot of work to make sure people are following the law once they get their permits approved. But you talk to them. Ask them how these new planning and zoning regulations are going to affect you. In some cases they may help. In some cases they may not. So this whole exercise of spreading the word is happening because they rush through with very little attendance at the public hearing, the elimination of Section 10.6 that was in the regulations for 22 years designed to balance the regulations when they extended the side yard setbacks from 15 feet to 35 feet in the Highland Lake District. So we decided that we would try to get everybody, as many people as we could, to understand what these regulations are. And that's not an easy thing. Not an easy thing, as I said, on all the other programs. It takes a lot of time, costs money. People have other things to do. People aren't always rational when you discuss it with them. They get mad at you and they think maybe you don't know what you're talking about. But anyway, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to spread the word, get everybody that can to get down there, go over their plans with these people before these planning and zoning regulations get approved by this planning and zoning commission. Now, we do have some questions that were raised at the public hearing especially the one where the consultant, Sean Suter, that we pay a lot of money to, I don't know, 50000 or so, to help us rewrite these regulations, said that he wouldn't, didn't want to touch the Highland Lake District regulations. He didn't want anything to do with that. He said that very clearly in his presentation because he thought it was very complicated and it would be very difficult to achieve and it would take a lot more thought and study, things like that. So he left that up to the subcommittee of these commissioners 
and the leader of the ZBA, Zoning Board of Appeals, to deal with that issue. Now, that seems kind of funny to me. Kind of weird, really. You hire a consultant, and then you don't listen to his advice. But you go on and do what you want to do anyway because you have a hidden agenda. A hidden agenda to make the town a commuter town heavily laden with environmental rules and regulations that may or may not be effective. Often when you talk to limnologists like that, they don't agree amongst themselves on what's good and what's bad for the environment. You know, we got that uh, whole thing happening at the national and world level as well. What's happening with our environment? How can we keep it? So there has to be a balance there somewhere. But when Sean Tudor said, the consultant said, that he didn't want to really participate in those negotiations, I found it very interesting. Because what he did do on the bookkeeping side of all this making it easier for people to apply, making it easier for the commissioners to make decisions, make it easier for people to understand the regulations by speaking in English instead of numbers and things like that, or red colors or whatever other colors they use. That's all good stuff. No argument there. But the devil, as I told you last week, is in the details. The devil's always in the details. You hear that everywhere you go in business. The devil is in the details. And that's why we say, get a rough idea what you want to do over the next 10 or 20 years with your property or what your future owners might want to do. Go down there and see if you can find out if there's any devils in the detail for your own property. Now remember, they may end up saying to you, well, you can do this, but. Or you can do this, if. Or you can do this, maybe. Or you can do this, perhaps. Well, then it's going to cost you money either way when you go in. And most people who understand planning and zoning try to get rid of the ifs, ands, and buts in the whole process to make it much simpler for people to get in present their case for a minimal cost. We're not in business to ensure that the land use engineers and land use attorneys make a lot of money. We're not in that business at all. They are, but we're not. We want to try to get everything balanced so that we can do as much as possible at a rational cost. It still will cost you. But you want to do it at a rational cost and you want to know up front exactly what you're getting into and how much it'll cost and how long it will take. And you want to get rid of all these if, ands, and buts that are in the whole process. That's what we say. So having said all that, it's hard to add too much more except to say if you can encourage anybody at all who does understand the regulations, like Michael Hamm does, and other people that have been on planning and zoning in our town or other towns for many years, and there's several people like that around here, or legal people that are in the town to give you advice free if they're your relatives or you're in your political party or in your church or in any of your organizations. If you can get any of that, that will help you a little bit. But we should try to get as many of those kind of people as possible and as many landowners as possible that want to do development are concerned about this over the next 10 to 20 years to get back to the next public hearing and the following public hearings, if any. There'll certainly be one more for the application, but that's mainly headed for uh, resolving um, section. 10.6 and getting its wording back into the new regulations, which we may or may not be able to do. But we can say we gave it the best try possible. And when I get to the pearly gates, and that isn't too far away from me, 
And they ask me, what did you do to help your fellow residents when you were down there on that earth in the troubled city of Winston in Winchester? I said, well, I tried to help them understand that we need to raise more revenue, more advantageous revenue for the town and city so that we could balance the budget and have more in money to protect our environment, get things roadworthy, bridgeworthy, and get good educations for our people that were in the bottom 30% of the state test scores. I tried all that. Didn't get very far. And just before I got here to these pearly gates, I tried to help get the planning and zoning regulations balanced. The brand new, totally rewritten planning and zoning regulations that eliminated Section 10.6 for non-conforming property owners all over town in the city to help balance their needs when the side yard setbacks were changed, especially in the Highland Lake District. Because I've always been on the side of property owners' rights. And part of the reason for that is that I lived with a lot of people in Torrington, Connecticut when I was young that didn't have any property whatsoever and would have been tickled pink to have property once they could afford it. And once they got the property, they certainly didn't want anybody to infringe on their rights to use that property in a practical, well-meaning, balanced manner. They didn't want to see people take those rights away from them, and I can't blame them at all. Can't blame them a bit. So now we're getting towards the last 10 or 15 minutes of this program. There will be another program before the next public hearing But now I want to talk just a bit about some of the things that were missing from the last public hearing. They were promised, but uh, they ran out of time and everybody was tired. It was two and three quarter hours, so they didn't go over them. But here are the following issues that will be brought up at the next public hearing. Come and hear them discussed. This will be short because I'm running out of time, but here we go. The first is bulk storage in our town, the placing of that. The second is assisted living in the rural residential zone. There's a request for that by somebody. The next one is decks and patios set back at least 20 feet. That's very interesting. Will be discussed. Sheds, that's very interesting. Most people want to shed one way or another to put their tools in, etc. That's on the table. A-frames. How high can you go with an A-frame? They're going to discuss that at the next public hearing. Continuation. Side yard setbacks in a rural residential zone. That's of interest to people. They've talked it over with Steve and he'll be discussing it. A structure allowance. That's going to be interesting. I don't totally know what that's all about, but we'll find out at the public hearing. Steve Sadlowski will present them to all at the next public hearing. I'm trying to make sure that I convince you or try to convince you. That's all I can do. Can't force you to do anything. To pay attention here. Just like you were going to school, you had to pay attention. If you didn't pay attention, you didn't learn much. And as any teacher will tell you, if you don't want to learn, you can't learn. If people don't want to learn, you can't teach them. 
So I understand that. And when people ask me why I continue to do this, even though nobody cares and nobody wants to participate and nobody wants to learn, I always say I'm doing it for those who do want to participate and those who do want to learn and who those who do want to protect their property rights and those who don't want to let the government run over them, which P&Z always seems inclined to do. Now again, there are many good things in the regulations, I'm sure of that. And there are many things, especially from the bookkeeping viewpoint, that will help everybody. But there are also things in these new regulations that ret retard your growth, retard your ability to do things, ensure that we become a town where everybody has to travel to Torrington to buy things or towards Hartford, where everybody has to travel to work in Torrington or towards Hartford or elsewhere. That's the kind of community that these planning and zoning regulations are encouraging. Now, we know what will happen once these are accepted, if they're accepted in the present form, which they probably will be, because these people mean to get their ideas made into law. Then, most of the properties that are non-conforming will go down in value because less over time, because less and less people are going to want to buy those properties. The properties that are conforming, and they said in the public hearing there's only 17 of those on Island Lake, and a lot more, of course, elsewhere, their values will go up because people will be able to do things. They'll be able to add on to their properties within the regulations. And they want to encourage that. There was one ZBA member that once said in a meeting that they only wanted to have million-dollar houses on Highland Lake. Got in a bit of a pickle over that. And I believe that the applicant made a big issue out of it, and in the end got what he wanted, despite those comments. But that's probably why, the way they're thinking. Hey, let's get a lot less, much more expensive housing in and ask people to do like I did. My wife and I bought the property next door from people we grew up with who owned it. That allowed me to add a nice kitchen for her and a few other things, and it Got me a new bungalow down on the water that, after many years of fighting with the town, got approval to tear down and rebuild because it was rotten and it was infested. And it was built in 1908 for a family that had seven children. And in those days, they slept out in the yard because they didn't have enough room in the bungalow during the summer. They only used it during the summer. And they had outhouses. And there weren't even any tar on the roads in those days. And the water was much lower when they first built that. The water was probably eight feet lower than it is now. It was first raised in 1860 or so for the factories because they were running out of water in the summer and all, so they raised the lake. And then it was raised in the 1960 or so for the boats, the speed boats. It seems kind of ridiculous to me. That wiped out a lot of the beaches. So they're moving more and more and more in that environmental direction, and they're hoping people will buy up their neighbor's property because the neighbors can't do much more with it, and it's devaluing and tear down the small buildings and build big million-dollar houses. That might be it. That might be it. And that's good for those who own the million-dollar houses. Not so good for the majority of the people who have non-conforming properties, not million-dollar houses. If you look around the lake now, you'll find a few million-dollar houses being built on very small lots. 
because they can build within the footprint and they can go up to 30 feet to the height. So they're kind of doing that. Now, if you want to see that kind of environment, just drive down from New York to Washington, D.C. and look on the Jersey Shore and you see those tall houses packed in all the way down the Jersey Shore. I've never been out in New York to the islands and all, but I don't know what they're like out there. Maybe they have more land. But anyway, we're going to be heading towards over, say, 50 years, not over two or three. I think if you get $1 million house in a year, that'll be a lot. But we're going to be heading more towards that kind of an environment. People who can afford to come in, buy up their neighbor's property, and build a million-dollar house. And that's a small amount of people. Maybe one every few years for the next 50 years or so. Who knows? Depends on the state economy and the federal economy and how tough these P&Z regulations will be once people realize what they really mean. And that'll take time. It'll take people to go in and apply for a permit. Now, most people who come in from New York or New Jersey or anywhere else where they have different rules that are much more helpful to property owners are amazed when they go in for a permit in our town. For years, they didn't even have a planning director to talk to. When Ray Carpentino was here, and we, we could go in and ask him, Ray, what do we need to do to, what do we need to bring to these meetings? And he would tell us. He would prepare us. Steve Sedlowski will do the same thing as long as he lasts here. That's the big question when you see excellent people like our great town manager we have now, Robert Geiger, and our very, very good planning director, land use director that we have now. How long will they last? How long will they be able to put up with this? How long will it take to, for the politicians to force them out? That's the big question. So I say take advantage of them while you're here, while they're here. Get in there and try to help them. Try to help them balance the needs of the town and the community and its expenses and its revenue. And when I pass out my son's spreadsheet and pipeline that was done after the last 2014, 2015 audit, I'll be passing that out on October 3rd, making it public. I've already put it out to many MBAs and other financially astute people in the area. If you can read those things, it might help you, or if you know somebody who can, or if your accountant can have a look at them. It might help you. You might not. But all these things are meant to try to balance people's needs, property owners, rights, the revenue for the town, the revenue for the schools, the expenses for the town, the expenses for the schools. That's what all these things are meant to do. And there's never a one-punch ending. It always takes many, 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 many meetings, many, 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 many discussions, many, 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 many changes in selectmen and finance board. We have one of the worst finance boards we'll ever have right now. We can get better. But even the towns that have good finance boards are still in trouble, especially if they're in the Rust Belt here, where people are leaving instead of coming. And people that uh, pay good property taxes that are advantageous because they don't use too many of the things in the town, but they pay a lot of property taxes for all their properties. They're becoming less and less. They're, uh, they're heading out. They're going where they don't have to put up with all this monkey business. So anyway, I'm giving it a shot. I'll be back again next week with another program. So at least I can say, when I get to the pearly gates, I tried my best. I did everything I could within my means 
to help my fellow residents, property owners, renters in the area, stores in the area, and everything else. I tried my best to help them try to understand what's happening as we head more and more towards a socialistic bedroom community. And watch out when you go across Route 44 at 8 in the morning or 5 in the afternoon. It's a set at the public hearing. You don't want to get hit by all those cars streaming in and out of town because we're becoming a bedroom community. With that, I say good night. Here's the song again. This town is your town. This town is my town. This town was made for you and me, not PNZ. can all thank Woody, too. Woody would have helped us. He would have spread the word. He would have written a song. Thank you, Woody. Good night to all. Show up at the continuance of the public hearing on October 11th, 2016.